Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, the big news this week is the government has shut down. Uh, well, you know, I don't know how for all long, but <laughs> the bad news <laughs> is I sent my passport <laughs> renewal in this week, and so I'm never going to see it again. I think I'll, I'm more likely to get it out of like Italy or Spain than I'm going to get it out of the United States government. Anyway, so a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff going on. And I thought rather than, uh, I'll go through the data, but there's a couple of little things that are leftovers that people have been asking me about. So the first thing is, we're all, everyone's asking me about getting their flu shot, getting their flu shot. Now's the time to get your flu shot. October is perfect. But we're now, the CDC is now reviewing last year's uh, uh, flu results. And I think this is important as you consider getting your child vaccinated and you. They reviewed the data in, in the MMWRs, their morbidity mortality weekly report. And they went back and looked at all the data for flu last year. And it turned out that 24-25 flu season last season was extremely bad for children. 280 deaths and 109 of those were due to some very serious encephalopathy. It's the most since uh, the 2009-2010 uh, H1N1 pandemic. And so it was really, it was actually bad. And if you think about it, the median age was seven years uh, old. And where the vaccine information was available, 89% of those who died were not vaccinated against the flu. So as you contemplate this flu season, and no matter what you're listening, all the noise out there, be sure to get your uh, flu shot. And actually my little, my little grandson, uh, JP Klotman, uh, had a little Band-Aid because he had just gotten his flu shot. I was very proud of him and his parents for getting a flu shot. Now, in general, uh, it's an interesting picture in the United States. Most of the respiratory viruses are pretty low, uh, but and COVID is coming down nationally, but it's very spotty. So if you look at flu is very low, RSV is low. But if you look at in nursing home residents, so those who are most vulnerable, these are case rates for 100,000 residents of a nursing home. There are a lot of cases of COVID. This is COVID and a lot of hospitalizations going up through that group. If you look at the national data, it was very high, peaked in sort of August or so and is beginning to come down, but it's still pretty high. Even though it's coming down, it's still 7.8% of respiratory diseases um, in, in presenting to emergency room are positive, test positive. And the same thing for emergency room visits. It's still high. The severity indicators are coming down. This is hospitalizations. And if you look at deaths, that's always a, a, obviously a lagging indicator. These people who are dying probably got sick in late August, so it takes a while. Now, the COVID-19 wastewater data nationally, and this is each one of these uh, uh, graphs represent the national data. The black is the national data, and then there's regional and statewide data. But the main thing is it was very high, almost as high as uh, in, in January, but it's beginning to come down. But again, that's very spotty. And I want to show you an example. So in Texas, it's actually pretty high. It's considered moderately high because most of the stations aren't bad, but these navy blue dots, mostly in Dallas and Harris County, the two most populous counties, uh, are showing uh, a lot of uh, viruses. And if you look at the TEFI data for Texas, that's actually quite high. Now, uh, the, what's interesting is enterovirus D68 is also kind of up there. I got sick about four days ago, five days, have an upper respiratory infection, COVID negative, flu negative. My guess is it's enterovirus D68. So my wife said, well, what about North Carolina? She's a Duke. And I said, well, let's look at North Carolina. It's actually extremely high. COVID levels in wastewater are extremely high. And there are all these navy blue dots. And I couldn't figure out why they were so high. So I figured, let me look at what colleges are in those things. So it turns out every navy blue dot represents a university. <laughs> Durham County, Duke, Orange County, UNC, uh, New Hanover, UNC, Wilmington, every single place, including McDowell County, which is McDowell Community College, has as a concentration of students. And you know how students are. In the middle of COVID, whenever we brought students back together, that's the, that's the, that's the cauldron of how to, how to incubate uh, viruses. Anyway, so that's, I think, the reason. As I've mentioned before, XFG is the dominant one, 83% of the viruses now are XFG. If you look just at the end of um, August 23rd, it was 77%. This is September 20th, it was 83%. And if you look at September 27th, just one week later, it's 85%. So XFG is the dominant virus uh, variant of COVID. Uh, traveler's data is beginning to plateau. Uh, this is people who come in on planes and airports in eight major areas. Uh, and you can see it's plateaued, and just like the United States now, XFG is the dominant variant, 84%. Uh, 
So one of our one of my viewers said, uh, "I hope, sure hope that they're, the variant that they're vaccinating against is XFG, and it turns out it's not." I mentioned this last week. Last year, the dominant variant was LP 8.1, and early on when they were trying to figure out what would be the vaccine target, a lot of people were suggesting LP 8.1. Turns out both Pfizer and Moderna picked JN1, and it tur that turned out to be pretty smart. So the new next spike vaccine of JN1 is more closely related to XFG than is LP 8.1. So it should be pretty good, actually. And as I mentioned last week, it's not to the whole spike protein, uh, it's just to the receptor domain. So it's a lower dose and more immunogenic. I got my COVID vaccine a couple days ago. I was gonna wait actually until it was higher, but I figured I might as well get it because you never know what this government's gonna do. You may not be able to get it. All right, so I got a person asked me about fluoride. I mean, I, without, you know, I mentioned before, one of the initiatives of Make America Healthy Again was to remove fluoride from the water. I'm not going to say it was, that's one of the dumbest ideas, but it's right up there. It's among one of the dumbest ideas ever. And uh, so there are, it's left to the states. There are a number of states that have actually now banned fluoride in the water, Kentucky, Louisiana. Amazingly enough, mostly are re Republican, but <laughs> Massachusetts also banned it. I'm not sure what they're thinking. And states where the bills failed were Tennessee, Montana, Arkansas, and the Dakotas. Now, I love this, I love this because do you remember Mike Myers? And Austin Powers, yeah, baby, yeah, yeah baby. So, so Mike Myers, and, and people forget the premise of Austin Powers. Austin Powers was a secret agent who was cryogenically fro frozen in 1967. And, and Mike Myers was trying to portray what would it be like to be someone from England in 1967, now running the modern world. And the best thing he could come up with was bad teeth. And so this whole thing was, bad teeth. Yeah, baby! And why does that make sense? Well, England's first attempt at fluoridation was in 1964, and it didn't become a national act until 1985. So one of the major characteristics was bad teeth. And so we're going to go back, <laughs> we're going to all look like Austin Powers if we don't get a little bit smarter. And, and the history is really interesting. Uh, in 1945, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, it was the first attempt to do put fluoride in the water. And they followed uh, children in school for many, many years, and there was a significant de decline in, in dental caries. And that was considered one of the first and best public health efforts in history. And it was so successful that President Truman in 1948 signed legislation that created the National Institute of Dental Research. And the whole idea was to address the national issue of the epidemic of tooth decay. Why? Because so many males <laughs> were kept out of the military during World War II because of tooth decay. So it was really a big issue, and during the 50s, that success at Grand Rapids became a really uh, major success, and so actually the whole field of dentistry is prevention. We, we were, we're trying to make medicine preventive health. <laughs> dentistry accomplished that by getting rid of the major uh, issue of, of tooth decay by uh, fluor putting fluoride in the water. So why are we taking fluoride out of the water? Yeah, baby! <laughs> You'll have to ask. You'll have to ask Austin Powers. He's the only one. He's the only one that knows what's going on in Washington. Yeah, baby. So anyway, uh, so one other uh, interesting paper I thought you'd be uh, you might want to hear about since I mentioned longevity issues last, last week or the week before. This woman is the, was the oldest living one. She passed away, Maria Marrera, 117 years old. And so Dr. Manuel Estelar wanted to see what was going on with her. Why did she live so long? So he got some blood samples. It was kind of interesting. Um, so she had some uh, genetic variants that were linked to immune fitness and cardiovascular protection. She didn't have ApoE4, which is associated with Alzheimer's. She had a very low epigenetic age, so her methylation was very low. You know, she, by that, she was 23, younger than her, 23 years younger than her stated age. Uh, she had great lipid profiles. Her VLDL was very low and her, her HDL was very high. She had a wonderful microbiome. She ate yogurt every day, so people wondered about that. She had very low inflammatory indicators, and she had a Mediterranean diet. Now, I say this, we've talked a lot about association studies. None of this is causal, but it is very interesting. If you look at what is more tightly associated than all of those factors, being poor and uneducated is much more closely linked to having a shorter life than anything else. So, Anyway, it's interesting, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about longevity factors. 
Anyway, I want to end today with some shout outs. Uh, I'm very proud of this one. The Midland Independent School District celebrated the launch of their STEM plus M initiative at four of their middle schools. This is like what we do in Houston in our Ruskin Ryan Academies and all over the state now. Uh, we partnered with the district uh, to bring our program to them with a generous grant from the uh, Scharbauer Foundation. And this new initiative gives direct access of our Baylor folks who developed the curriculum along with coaching for teachers to create a STEM plus M curriculum in Midland. And it's, a, it's really fantastic. We're really excited about uh, and love partnering with Midland, uh, Texas. Also, the recipients of the 2025 Visionary and Eye Care Resident Recognition Awards were recently announced. And uh, congratulations to fourth year resident, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Sanjay Gupta, not Sanjay Gupta, uh, who received the Best in Ophthalmology Award. And then congratulations to Dr. Austin uh, Wong, a 2025 graduate of our medical school, who was recently announced as the recipient of the United States Public Health Service Physician Professional Advisory Committee Excellence in Public Health Award. That is way too long a title for an award, but it's the first time we've actually had somebody win the national award. So this marks the first national award. And so congratulations, he's now an intern <laughs> suffering in every universe like all interns. So have a wonderful weekend and I can't wait to see you all.